就没法管，现在类似一改，没关系。Tukamusaidia Kama Good afternoon. I am Susan Markham. I am the Senior Gender Coordinator at USAID, and I am here to introduce our next panel, the CSO Voices panel. Um, as Ambassador Russell mentioned, we have a great relationship with civil society, and they have been key as we have created and are now starting to implement the Adolescent Girl Strategy. Civil society are great partners to us, technical experts, researchers, and partners, and also, as Ambassador Russell said, they hold us accountable. And this will be important, obviously, for the folks of us that you're meeting today, but also as we move into the next administration, because we want to make sure that the commitment stays strong, and we really um, work to implement the adolescent girl strategy, and all the work that's gone into it becomes real. So I'm going to interest, introduce Lena Minchu now, who is a, the moderator for this panel, as they look at the reflections of how we got to the pan, uh, adolescent girl strategy and then thoughts about how we should move forward. Uh, Lena is a program officer for the International Women's Health Coalition, where her work focuses on adolescents and youth sexual and reproductive health and rights. She has represented them at the UN in New York, as well as in Ethiopia and Geneva. And she also is one of the co-chairs of the Girls Not Brides Coalition. Thank Are we on? I may be loud enough to not need a microphone anyway. But thank you, Susan, for that kind introduction, and to the US government for having a CSO panel and FHI 360 for hosting us all today. Uh, as Susan said, I'm Lena Minshew with the International Women's Health Coalition and a co-chair of Girls Not Brides USA. And I'm joined with these wonderful uh, collaborators and co-panelists. Larry Thompson, who is a senior policy manager at the International Center for Research on Women and a fellow co-chair of Girls Not Brides USA. Cherner Ba, a girl champion, advocate for global education, and a former refugee who now serves as an associate at the Population Council and Dr. Corey Hyman, who is Chief Innovative Innovation Officer and Executive Director of the Accelerator Program at Room to Read. 
So we have been asked to help provide the CSO perspective on the adolescent girl strategy, or what I call the adolescent girl strategy, the US global strategy to empower adolescent girls. Um, not just commenting on what's in the strategy, but talking about how we can move forward and towards implementation. I'm going to act as moderator, but I will also be giving my two cents. So I'd, I'll start with saying just how extremely excited about this strategy I am. As Ambassador Russell mentioned, we have been working for a number of years to have the US government create and implement a whole of girl, whole of government approach to empowering adolescent girls. To look at girls' lives in all of their complexities um, with clear eyes and with an eye towards solutions to the barriers that girls face to thriving. As a co-chair of Girls Not Brides USA, I'm obviously thrilled to see that ending child marriage is a priority in the strategy. As a feminist and a sexual and reproductive health and rights advocate, I was thrilled to see that patriarchal gender norms and uh, the barrier that is control of girls bodies was in the strategy, and as an international advocate, I was absolutely flabbergasted to see all the number of ways that the strategy talks about diplomatic ways to raise adolescent girls um, through a number of fora, including the Sustainable Development Goals. But beyond specific issues that are important to each of our organizations, I think what's particularly important about the strategy is that it's, in fact, whole of girl and that it takes this holistic lives, look at girls' lives, and talks a lot about the gender inequalities that are, in fact, at the root of being barriers to girls thriving. So those are just some of the reasons that the adolescent girl strategy is so important, that the US government leads on this issue and puts its weight behind adolescent girls thriving. As a CSO representative and as an advocate, I would love to say that we were kind of the, the reason that the adolescent girl strategy actually went forward um, and that the strength of the strategy comes from their deep collaboration, but that seems a little self-serving. So, Lyric, um, do you want to talk to us about how the CSO um, collaboration went and particularly what it means moving forward when we talk about implementation? Sure, thank you. Um, so this is actually my first day touching this, <laughs> but about my fifth year working on this. Yeah. So I just want to echo the thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Way to go, U.S. government. Thanks. Um, I just want to echo the thanks for um, Ambassador Russell, your leadership on this issue. It truly wouldn't have happened without you. Um, you know, delightful that this is a part of the United States of Women Summit, um, because as I was watching all those female members of Congress come across the stage yesterday, I thought, and tomorrow we get to hear from all the women in the executive branch <laughs> who are champions in their own right and truly, um, you know, put your shoulder to the wheel to make this happen. So thank you. I know we are sometimes difficult. But also to especially recognize Emily Carney, who is the staff lead standing in the back, whose birthday was yesterday. So the First Lady threw her a summit to congratulate her on the, also the birth of this, which was printed yesterday. So thank you. And with that, back to how great we are. Um, yeah, so just backing up very briefly, and I know we have limited time, it's important to put this in the context of, I think, civil society brings lots of different things to the table. We get kind of lumped in together, but if you look at the diversity in the five coalitions that Ambassador Russell talked about, which represented countless organizations beyond them, if you look at the diversity of what those organizations are doing, research, advocacy, programs, um, backing up into the middle 2000s, we had organizations like CARE taking members of Congress to the field to see these programs in action. This truly is a bipartisan issue, um, and there's support for that on both sides of the aisle, and a lot of that comes from organizations that have programs and can demonstrate you can change these issues. People like to say gender is pernicious, you know, culture won't change. That's that's a bunch of hooey, and when people see that live and in, in, in person, it really makes a difference. Um, so there were lots of years of just bringing the evidence 
taking folks to the field, making the case that girls really could be a part of US foreign policy, which was a radical idea at one point in time. And now look at how many of us are celebrating that this has happened. Um, but in terms of the actual drafting process, I'd like to say a couple of lessons we learned through what I thought was having worked on some of the other strategies, having worked on the GBV strategy, the National Action Plan, a truly unprecedented level of openness to consultation from the government and a truly unprecedented, well, not un necessarily unprecedented, but a truly inspirational level of organization by civil society. So we had the five coalitions named who were participating in this process. We also came to the table and said, how can we make this a truly constructive process for you? Often, I think we've all been in a room where you get called to an agency and we're gonna consult you today on a topic to be named later, and you get there and you have no idea what you're gonna say because you don't know what you're talking about, and then that's supposed to be an effective way to consult. No, this was truly a process of being able to say, these are the points we're thinking about. Here's some draft language. What do you think about this? What do your programs tell us about your issue that you're representing? And then each coalition was responsible for going back, writing its policy brief, citing that. The resource list in this thing is amazing. And um, so bringing the evidence, bringing the expertise, but also being very organized and truly having a trustful dialogue. Um, and they were open to telling us when they couldn't do things we asked for, but I'm happy to say that there really wasn't much that we asked for that didn't end up here. So pleased to say that and just, um, I, I, it's not exactly light reading, but I hope that you can pick one up and give it a look. It's truly, I think it's our voices in here. Thanks, Lyric. Turner, I'll move to you next um, as a representative of one of the civil society organizations that will likely be helping to implement the strategy. Um, as we've mentioned, the strategy is in fact rightfully broad. It's whole of girl, like we've been asking for. Um, but that is very difficult to do in reality. So based on the adolescent girl research that the Population Council has conducted over decades, are there one or two things that the U.S. government should be sure to especially prioritize moving forward? Well, thank you very much. And at the risk of uh, piling on the self-congratulation that's <laughs> going on here, I would say on behalf of the Population Council that, again, you're right, we, you know, we, we conduct a lot of research on adolescent and girls programs around the world. And reading through this strategy, I can, I, I can tell you that it's, it's not often you read through a strategy and it fills you with joy. Okay. It fills me with joy because I work on the field, in the field, all the time, and at policy levels at the UN. It's not often that you go through a process of this nature and at the end you have a product that you can be proud of and that you know has the potential to actually make a real difference. And so, again, congratulations to the US government and to you guys, all of us, that did make input into this because it is truly a revolutionary document and I think has the potential to actually change the game for girls around the world. Now having said that, what are the things that I think or we think could make a big difference that we should be continuing to focus on or, or make the priority going forward? Now consider this. Um, girls in, in, in Kenya, recent research in Kenya show that even if there's access to reproductive health services, girls do not make first contact with those services until after they've had their first pregnancy. Girls with a financial goal in South Africa are two or three times more likely to take control of their own lives and change their reproductive ha habits, just having a financial goal. It's simple but remarkable facts like that that can change oftentimes the trajectory of our programs and the nature of the kind of focus of our programs and the things that we're doing. So I'm saying one of the big things we absolutely have to continue to focus on is the learning agenda. What are we learning as we go on? As we continue to invest and change the game and, and, and use this strategy going forward, it's the things that we can learn or that we're learning to be able to make a difference. The second thing I would say, and it's closely connected to the learning agenda, is the unlearning agenda. Many of the things we've seen and that we've seen with our partners around the world who do excellent programs or with excellent intent, it's not because people don't want to do the right thing, but it's because we're so used to doing things as usual that we do not have the skills and the resources to be able to do it differently. 
And that's where I think this strategy and the U.S. government and our partners should focus on this relearning agenda. And I want to pay particular uh, respect to, to the DREAMS initiative, and Ambassador Briggs is here, because what the Pop Council is doing currently with DREAMS is working with partners across multiple countries through a process where we're building their capacity, helping, and the demand on this is just remarkable. We just, we, you know, the, when we started, the, the, our ambition was to work with, you know, do a training among many organizations and just recruit a few of them to work with, but almost every one of them say, please work with us to change and continue to see the change as we do this. So I think those two things will be really big game changers going forward. Thanks so much, Turner. I'm, Lyric, ICRW is obviously also a research institution and you've done a lot of remarkable work over a number of different issues, child marriage, education, et cetera. And obviously the learnings that you have um, created help to form kind of the viewpoint of the strategy. So looking at the final product, um, what strikes you most from that perspective? Sure. Um, first of all, as Ambassador Russell said, that it's really all in here. Um, that you have, you know, I, there was a, this beautiful quote yesterday that um, Jaha, who's a, a FGM and child marriage survivor and activist, said about we need to make sure that girls and women are not just footnotes to the research that you then forget about after lunch. And I was a little nervous because we're talking about this over lunch. Um, but I really think that when you have, when you can be evidence-based, when you can lead with the figures of 15 million girls married each year, 200 million plus cut, as the First Lady so often reminds us, 62 million girls out of school, unplanned pregnancy, early pregnancy, HIV rates being you know, skyrocketing in adolescent girls and the leading cause of death for girls 10 to 14, those are compelling statistics that can get you to this. But then once you get to this, how do you get to action? So being evidence-based, but action-oriented. And I think as we're looking towards the next administration, there's a fairly good roadmap here in terms of how the agencies are committing to coordinate themselves. Um, but I think we need to acknowledge that we have to be pretty rigorous in our case for what works, the unlearnings, the being willing to you know, admit when we make mistakes and, and do other things. There's a pretty rigorous um, uh, set of indicators that each agency is saying they're going to be looking for and this is what success likes, looks like and this is how we're going we're gonna to go about our learning process. Um, and then just as a final plug, I have to draw your attention to the fact that the five objectives of the girl strategy actually reflect five solutions to end child marriage that the International Center for Research on Women has uncovered in its evidence. So I really do think research can be transformative, but then what do we do with the policy once we get there? You know, I noticed that five matched, too. Yeah, so did you? Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. thanks. <laughs> Corey, I'll move on to you next. Um, Room to Read, as I'm sure most of us know, is an organization that works in Asia and Africa uh, to achieve literacy and gender equality in education. So that when you, so when you saw one of the strategy's objectives was to provide quality education to girls, um, that must have been a pretty good day in the office. Um, but beyond words on paper, what is the importance of this strategy to your organization, to your field more broadly, and then I guess what pieces does the next administration need to pick up? Thank you very much. Well, I have to admit, um, in contrast to my colleagues and their organizations, Room to Read played an extremely modest role in the creation and support for the strategy. So I have to thank them, but more importantly, thank Ambassador Russell and her team and all of the government agencies that did put it together because I think it's an incredible document and I think that organizations such as Room to Read are tremendous beneficiaries of the information. It provides an incredible um, tool for knowledge and for action. It brings the issue of a, an incredibly important population in a way that has never been seen, I've never seen, uh, from the US government or otherwise to, to identify the population of adolescent girls. Each word in the title, global, strategy, empower, adolescent girls is meaningful. Um, and identifies um, an important population and the really complex challenges as well as the important solutions. I think um, as an implementing organization, we have been very concerned over the past few years uh, that the education agenda, the girls in education agenda uh, issue was going to receive less attention over time because of the incredible success in achieving more or greater gender parity 
equal enrollments in primary school. More countries are achieving it. We're still not there yet. Secondary school, making good progress. And I think what the adolescent girl strategy does is to help us to remember that simply being in school at the same time is not enough. And that girls and boys come to school with different experiences. They have different experiences when they are in school. And the transitions that they make after school uh, can be very different as well. So even when girls are achieving at a very high level in their academics, there are challenges in those kinds of transitions. And I think what the strategy does as well for us as an advocacy tool and what the US government um, with its bully pulpit is to appreciate the fragility of the situation of adolescent girls. The fact that with all of this progress, that the second that there is an economic downturn, the minute that there is a health issue in a family or in a community, that is the adolescent girls who will be the first to um, be uh, displaced and, and will have the, it will be removed from school and will have to deal with the challenges. So we're only one generation in, su in success and um, we still have an incredible ways to go and I think the strategy does a brilliant job in articulating both the case for the importance of adolescent girls, not to the exclusion of other populations, um, but why this particular population needs our support um, so much. So thank you very much. Thanks. I mean, I think we all know it kind of goes without saying, but the success of the strategy will be the implementation of the strategy. And it's important to hear how implementers really do find the strategy to be impactful. Um, in fact, we've already seen some ways in which the strategy has been used by the US government in their diplomatic outreach at the com Commission on Population and Development, the US led on um, language that called for more data for 10 to 14 year olds, which was huge and it, it's a key population that we're missing information on. Um, we've also seen the US and Canada and the US and the Nordic states release joint statements that say we're going to work together on this issue and this issue, adolescent girls or this population, was in the same sentence as climate change and border security and other issues that I think a lot of people give more weight to. So those are enormous, I think, diplomatic gains, um, but I think we know that resolutions and, and statements really only go so far. Um, so, Cherner, you're, you're doing significant work in Sierra Leone um, with adolescent girls specifically, and beyond prioritizing, um, prioritizing adolescent girls and beyond general talk about investment, what do we need to specifically do for girls? Thank you very much, and I'm happy you asked that because at the end of the day, I like there's language in the, in the strategy that says we, we measure success at the level of the girl. And at the Pop Council, we're very particular about that, that at the end of the day, you know, I mean, there's been, a, in the past 10 years, a lot of focus now on girls globally. We do a lot of PR campaigns. Sometimes we measure success by how many tweets and how it trends. That's all nice, but the real change actually happens at the level of the girl uh, in the local community. So what we're hoping to see with this is the level of the kind of institutionalization um, across the board and, and with our partners on the ground. So in Sierra Leone, for example, we work with a network of organizations across the country who are focused on adolescent girls. We want to make sure that going forward, uh, both when USAID or Peace Corps or the other partners within the US government infrastructure, if they have a call on uh, green energy or green technology, for example, that it clearly has provisions to take into consideration the needs of adolescent girls. Because we got here, let's remember that, because we all assume that when we dealt with youth or children, we we're dealing with girls. And, and it's very easy that we'll go back to that where you know, we're doing a green energy program and those sectors are considered like kind of siloed. But until and unless we make sure that when we're having conversation with the USAID education folks, for example, that the priorities of adolescent girls are core and are critical. And we're measuring our success at the country level, but also at the international level by what's the difference that are being made, what are the differences that are being made at the level of the girls, and how we're measuring that, how we're making sure that we have the tools to be able to do that. And these are some of the things that we're working on and developing with our partners on the ground. And I think that's what's gonna be the big difference maker. Thanks. I, I think I'll ask pretty much the same question to you, Corey, um, heading back to education for a minute and looking at it from a place where we are achieving parity, um, but maybe the you know girls and boys don't actually have the same 
outcomes because of education. So what should the U.S. government invest in specifically through the strategy um, to actually allow girls to not just attend school but learn in school and thrive once they get out? Yeah, no, I, I think that the, the strategy and the SDGs have created um, a huge opportunity. Um, and I want to make sure that we don't lose the opportunity. And I think what that means is being really uh, mindful about the kind of research that we do about gender issues. So for example, I mentioned earlier that girls and boys come to school potentially with different experiences. They have different experiences in schools and may need either different skills uh, or different amounts of skills uh, to be able to be successful in transitioning into the next phases of their lives, whether it's further education or it's uh, employment or marriage or family or public service. Um, and so I think that we need tools, for example, um, the U.S. Department of Labor, a kid in a giving, uh, and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, among others, is funding a randomized control trial that we're doing at Room to Read on the life skills component of our um, girls' education program to understand those competencies that are more linked to girls' success in school. And I think that if we could take lessons from our studies and others and build those into metrics uh, that we can track over time uh, about those strategies, those issues that really are gendered, uh, and to be able to track and monitor and look at progress and invest in those, I think that would be a terrific service, both for this administration uh, and for the next. And then I would also say, uh, along the same lines, is I think we need to be very careful, too, when we make the case for adolescent girls. And I think the strategy also does a great job of really remembering that there are situations where it's important to focus on gender, and there are situations where the challenges and the issues faced um, of, uh, under re of people from under-resourced communities in low-income countries, um, the challenges are related to other things. And we need to be very mindful about when it's gender and when it's not. And we also need to be very mindful when we think about solutions, even in the case where there are challenges related to gender. Um, the solutions that are appropriate uh, to have a gender-related solution and um, those situations that may not require a gender-related solution. So, Quality of education is an issue that is going to improve the lives of all children, perhaps more for girls than boys. Let's not lose the opportunity to think of broader educational solutions along the way. Thanks. So we literally have one minute left, um, and we have an illustrious panel of women coming up in just a second to answer questions about implementation and institutionalization of the strategy. I know that you have all been writing your questions down um, over lunch, but I think we'll take panel privilege right now and go down the line and ask one question that we have been thinking about for the strategy and that we'd love to hear um, our esteemed panelists answering next. My question is the training aspect. How are folks in the different agencies going to be trained on the strategy so that when the next administration comes in, it's really hard to get rid of? So we'll just go down the line. Oh, go the we'll go the other way. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, there is, I notice, a new paragraph in here that it says lovely things about interagency coordination, uh, coordination with the National Security Council, and a role for civil society and the budget planning process. That's all I would ask for. So my question is, how are each of you going to commit to the transition process, highlighting that very important paragraph and this very important strategy, um, whether that's through writing transition memos, whether that's through staff outreach? I'd love to hear more about what that looks like on the inside. All right, so mine is, uh, again, at the risk of channeling something. But uh, what are the things you know and that you know that you don't know, <laughs> that we need to find out that will help you make a difference. Yeah, and I would say similarly um, that the issue is, is investments, um, that we know that there are a lot of different strategies uh, that are important for improving the lives of, of girls and women. Uh, and uh, to get some sense of how you see the relative prioritization given limited resources, do we need to focus on lower secondary education as a priority to get more girls through that phase before we focus on upper secondary education? Do we need to think about it differently? So thank you so much again to um, FHI 360 and to the government for letting us be on this panel. I promise Ambassador Russell we will do this to the next administration too. <laughs> thank you everyone.
I come from Matali. I drive from school because I don't get no support. My ma, my lady, and my papa here to send me to school. 62 million girls around the world who should be in school are not. That's not by accident. It's the direct result of barriers, large and small, that stand in the way of girls who want to learn. We often focus on the economic barriers girls face. School fees or, or uniforms, or how they live miles from the nearest school and have no safe transportation. It's also about attitudes and beliefs. It's about whether societies cling to laws and traditions that oppress women. We know that when girls are educated, they're more likely to delay marriage. Their future children, as a consequence, are more likely to be healthy. Their future wages increase, which in turn strengthens the security of their family. And national growth gets a boost as well. And that is why the United States government recently launched a new global girls' education effort called Let Girls Learn. As part of this initiative, U.S. Peace Corps volunteers will work side by side with local leaders, families, and girls themselves to help girls go to school and stay in school. They'll be creating mentoring programs, girls' leadership camps, and so much more. Girl empowerment is for a girl to be able to have the self-esteem and really the confidence to be able to feel like they can do anything they put their mind to. I will go to school again to achieve something in my life. Every child is precious, every girl is precious. Every girl deserves an education. Let girls learn.